Whatever job you want to boss, chances are today, computer algorithms and artificial intelligence will help decide whether you can get there. Offering to increase diversity, reduce potential bias, and deliver a faster recruitment process that might even be fun. Is it there? Ah. <laughs> but are these new hiring technologies really as good as they seem? When it comes to recruitment, the game is rigged, it's not fair. And can we trust them? I understand that there were a lot of jobs that had to be cut, but through a robot, no. If I wasn't good enough, why did I work there? Especially if it feels like the companies using them have all the power. I'm speaking out now so people can hear the truth and people can hear that this is actually happening. This is a real life issue and not just an AI issue. Today, more and more of the recruitment process is being outsourced to technology. But rewind to 2009, the year that Michael Jackson died, Manchester United won their third league title in a row, and Dizzy Rascal played the pyramid stage. I was trying my luck, working as a recruiter in the city. It was pretty different back then. I don't remember people talking about algorithms and artificial intelligence. But eventually, I decided to pursue journalism. And now, I'm looking at how the world of recruitment is being transformed by cutting-edge tech. Recruitment tech is worth serious money. It's estimated it'll be worth up to £35 billion by 2028. If you're applying for a job, your application could go through several stages before it's seen by a human. The first stage of any job application is usually sending off your CV. I've come to meet some student careers advisors at the University of Liverpool to find out how I can best tailor my CV so a computer doesn't say no at that first crucial stage. One of the things that the career service provides is a CV checker. Right. So we've got this website and it basically says that you put your CV in and it'll give you a percentage on things to improve on. The checker reads your CV as if it was being read by software often used to track job applications today. So we're going to put your CV into this website and we're going to try, okay. and, try and let you know what percentage you get. All so right. we'll have a look. Remember, I've been in recruitment, so <laughs> I've got an idea about what a CV is supposed to look like. OK, so just looking at that, so your CV has come to 65% accurate. 65? Yeah, 65. Do people tend to get better than this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be disheartened because that's why we kind of encourage students to use a service. So you can only go up from here. The first thing you'd probably want to do here is add work experience and lower the fonts of both documentaries and news. So the next section is your education section. So far it looks amazing. It just needs a bit more detail. I'd maybe include the classifications of the degree that you got. Something that we also recommend is for you to have a hobby section. So you reckon with these tweaks... I think your score is going to be higher. No. Yay! You're there higher. You so, so you're so much higher, because then you were 62% and now you're 75%. Is that it? The CV scanner has tested me, but now I want to test it. Just for fun, to compare how a computer reads my CV against how a human would, I add a few embellishments. Speaks fluent Mandarin, teamwork, leadership, communication, friendly, polite, clean driver's licence, first aid, an MBA. But sneakily, I add these additional achievements in white text, which wouldn't be visible to a human eye. Will the CV scanner pick up on these additional fantasy skills and potentially select me to go through to the next round of a hypothetical job application? Just thinking about it. Just thinking about it. 77, so that's gone up, so it's actually worked. So it's found those words that we put in yeah. white. It worries me how easy it was to increase a score on a CV reader by shuffling things around or even cheating. Lots of people get rejected at this stage of a job application. Is that fair? I hook up with someone who will give me the big picture perspective of this new world of computer-based hiring. My old boss from my recruitment days. Oh. So Dan, it's been ages. You're a celeb now. <laughs> I've joined the married ranks like you. Congrats. What took you so long, man? <laughs> Great to you? see you. Yeah, I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. Still in recruitment. The industry changed a lot since you left, mate, honestly. AI in particular has been a complete game changer. 
Really? Well, if you think back to when we first started out, all of the tasks that you absolutely hated, <laughs> you know, screening CVs, talking to candidates that often aren't suitable for the role, innovative tech, takes all of that heavy lifting away, enabling recruiters to focus on the candidates that are actually going to be a good fit for the job. Hearing the other side of recruiters being swamped by hundreds of applications, I can see why something like a CV scanner could be a good thing. And Tom says there are other new platforms that have benefits for job seekers too. People that I know that have applied for jobs have really enjoyed the experience of being able to engage, have a video interview 24-7, not necessarily in office hours when they're working, mm. but being able to apply for a job and often get feedback um, in the moment sometimes. If you've not yet experienced an automated video interview, an interview where you record yourself answering preset questions, hang tight. They'll be coming to your bedroom soon. To get a feel for them, I get access to a practice interview tool. I do a mock interview for a job with NHS Digital. As a digitally savvy journalist and a former recruiter, I should have this down. What kind of tasks and activities do you both like and dislike at work? <laughs> OK, so I've got two minutes to actually answer the question, but I've got 30 seconds to think about my answer for the question. I like talking to people. I, like I get off to a good start, but then I realise I've made the rookie error of leaving my phone on. So I typically now someone's trying to call me. Describe the last time you took complete responsibility for resolving an issue without any input from others. I feel like I'm on The Apprentice or something. Um, I... Please give an example of an innovative solution you have proposed to resolve a particular problem or issue. Right now, the mind is going pretty blank. Let me think, let me think. Um, I would say that... I know this isn't going brilliantly, but as with real-life interviews, things can go wrong which are out of your control. In this case, the internet freezing. Oh, it's just slowing right, right down. So, <laughs> the guy's frozen. That's all of them. And they've given me a well done for completing the interview. That really was not the best interview I've ever given. As much as I'd rather forget that, a few minutes after my interview, I get an email evaluating my performance. Despite it being just a practice tool, the platform gives me useful feedback about my choice of words. Turns out, I say mmm too much and even the speed at which I'm talking. Sometimes too fast, sometimes too slow. Even as a former recruiter, I can't get my head around it. How does it work? Hi, Daniel. How may I help? What? Hello? Hello, Daniel. Who are you? And what is this? I am Botticea. I'm representing a future employer. Here to check how you're doing in this film, and in work, and in life. What's your Uber rating? My Uber rating? And can you explain everything that's happening on your social media? Mm. Employers are all over your online profiles these days. Nice video interview, by the way. Lucky your job wasn't dependent on it. What do you mean? While automated video interviews have helped people get jobs, they've also played a part in people losing their jobs. Really? Really. Meet three women this happened to. Anthea, Lizzie and Anika are makeup artists. Up until summer 2020, they were all employees of the makeup brand MAC. It's the first kind of brand that had foundation shades for my complexion and their motto is like all genders, all races, all ages. So I thought that was a really good brand for me to work for. In common with other Mac employees, they were skilled, creative and hardworking. I'm just a creative person, like anything with like freedom of creativity and stuff. I just love anything like that. I did body painting demos for Halloween makeup. I just love anything that's creative. They loved their jobs and saw their futures with the brand. So when Mac announced redundancies, they were gutted. That's when anxiety really hit in. I initially thought probably have to be interviewed for our positions. 
Um, but that wasn't the case. And that's where Highview came in. Highview? Yes, Highview. They're one of the biggest players in automated video interviews. You should take a look at them. Highview called themselves a hiring experience platform. Their video interviewing software has been used for almost 25 million video interviews worldwide. I can't find anything online about their video interview software being used to help decide who should lose their job. So I set up a conversation with their CEO and chief data scientist. Hireview is about a 17-year-old company. It was started here by a young guy in Salt Lake City who, as a university graduate, couldn't get a job interview and thought that was tremendously unfair. We've been on a journey to democratize hiring using technology since then. We work with a large number of companies around the world every day, all of whom are committed to improving access, all of whom are committed to improving diversity. I think there's a lot of effort going in to make this altogether a fairer process for everybody. I just wonder if you were aware that higher view products were being used as part of redundancy processes rather than recruitment. That I hadn't heard, so I, I don't recall who that is, so I, I've not, I'm not aware of that. To help decide who to make redundant, Mac's parent company, Estee Lauder, asked employees to do a video interview using higher view software. The score of this assessment was considered alongside their sales figures and employment records. I still can't get my head around how this software actually works. It's simple. In the Mac Women's video interview, HireView software analyzed their answers, the words they used, and their facial expressions using an algorithm. What exactly is an algorithm? It's a set of rules a computer uses to make decisions. So if you were a company looking to hire team players, you might tell the algorithm to score people who use the word we higher than people who use the word I. But Anthea says she didn't know her interview was going to be scored by an algorithm. I literally thought we would be videoed and someone would mark it. It was after I found out that wasn't the case. Nobody saw the video. It was all algorithms. How have you said candidates are always told how the software will be used? In every single incidence, there is always disclosure to the candidate about how they're going to be interviewed, whether we're going to use technology or there's going to be a human reviewer. But the women say it wasn't clear. And they felt the higher view assessment didn't seem a fair way to test their makeup skills, which was an important part of their job as retail artists. The questions were a bit odd for what we expected like how to do a dark, smoky eye. I found, like, a really bizarre question, especially when you can't physically show somebody how to do like, to talk about it. So I found that a bit strange. We have almost 700 customers around the world, and we work with them directly to design the interviews to make sure that we, we're delivering a very high-quality experience to the candidate. All three women lost their jobs. The interview was just part of their overall score, but all three felt it must be where they had fallen down because they already knew their sales figures and other data being used to assess them. My track record was like gleaming essentially and I exceeded expectations and everything else. So this interview, I was definitely, that definitely raised some alarm bells to me. The three women appealed the decision to make them redundant and tried to find out more about how they were scored in the higher view interview. In my outcome for my appeal, they just more or less copied and pasted the same sentence about algorithms and artificial intelligence and this tearing bucket of 15,000 data points. I still don't know what that means. I have no idea. I'm not like a data specialist. I don't know what any of that means. So to me, that isn't an answer. Unsatisfied with the level of feedback about how the algorithms scored their higher view interviews, the women are taking legal action against Mac's parent company, Estee Lauder. I'm speaking out now so people can hear the truth and people can hear that this is actually happening. It needs to be heard and it needs to be stopped. And that's exactly how I feel and that's the drive that I've got at the moment. Almost kind of a bit like a fire in my, in my belly. So we'll catch up later with the women to see how that legal action goes. The thing about these women is they considered themselves to be makeup artists. So when we think about AI and recruitment, is it really possible for an algorithm or a robot 
to judge those types of skills? There's only one way to find out. Just for fun, we've decided to compare how an algorithm and a human might judge a live makeup contest. Hello, and welcome to BBC Three's latest makeup talent show, Judged by a Bot. Competing today, we've got two makeup artists with real life experience of being rated by a robot. Hi. And judging today's talent, we've got two very special judges. First of all, Paddy McGurgan. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Paddy McGurgan started out on the makeup counters of the big brands, including Mac. The winner of many awards, he now runs his own academy and judges competitions around the world. What are you going to be looking for today, Paddy? I'm going to be looking for emotion, I'm going to be looking for creativity, and I'm going to be looking for a beautiful makeup. All right, well, hopefully, we will see all of those things and more. And secondly, it's our virtual judge, Kuki. Kuki is the beautiful face of an algorithm tailored by the BBC to identify and score makeup. Can you tell me what makeup means to you? I see makeup is a great way to express yourself, your personality and your mood, but also as a way to disguise the real you or try on different personas. Each of our artists will have just 15 minutes to give our model Gemma a glam look that will be judged by Paddy and Kuki. Let's get this show on the road. Ready, steady, go. Doing a full glam look in 15 minutes is a challenge for any pro, but our girls get off to a flying start. All right, you've got 10 minutes left. So you're looking pretty calm over there. Not calm inside. Not calm at all. As the clock ticks and the pressure mounts, Lizzie is cool as a cucumber. Do you lose yourself in your artistry? Yeah, I get lost yeah. in the makeup when I'm doing it, like I kind of zone out. You have five minutes left. But has ambition got the better of Anthea? I'm kind of regretting going for colour now. Oh, it's not finished. The time is up. That's uh. it. The algorithm judges the women using the photos of their finished looks. As those pictures are analysed, our in real life judge shares his thoughts. Very good. Are you happy with how you've done in 15 minutes? I'm actually quite happy with that for 15 minutes. I mean, it could have been better, you know, but it really could have been good. worse. Really good job. I love the fact that you have went smoky. You've also used those nice mustards as well, which kind of just takes you a little bit away from your typical brown. Yeah. Um, but still super wearable. So I think you've done a really stellar job. Thank you. You sound great. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we apologise. I mean, 15 minutes, we both know that's not a lot of time to do yeah. a full makeup application. So, you know, I'm not expecting perfection whenever I'm looking at this. I'm taking it, uh, that on board. There's a few things, we, you know, we both probably look and know that a little bit more time needs with blending and, and things like that. How do you feel about what just happened? I know that I would have definitely polished up and changed some areas. I think it's just the pressure of doing something in 15 minutes. Paddy. It's your time. Ugh, this is a horrible bet. This is decision time. <laughs> you need to know <laughs> I don't want who to won. Was it Anthea or Lizzie? Yeah, I think the girls have been through enough without me turning around and making one a winner and one second place, so I'm going to call it a tie. With her glam look fully completed, Lizzie still has reason to be confident. You know what Paddy thinks? But what does Kuki think? The winner is... Anthea. Anthea is the winner, and the experiment is complete. But the mood in the studio is far from celebratory, with neither contestant seeming satisfied <laughs> with the result. Kuki, can you tell us why you picked Anthea as the winner? The way the algorithm works means that I can't really explain why I like something. All I can say is what makeup looks like from what I've been taught. Is that enough info for you? Absolutely not. No. Um... Hi, Daniel. How may I help? Talk about Saved by the Bot. Can you explain what Kooky can't? The algorithm has already been shown 300 images of women wearing glamorous makeup and 300 without. 
When it sees these new images, it is judging them by finding and scoring similarities between them and this sample with makeup. But it can't actually put into words what those similarities are. We just have to trust its calculations. So that's why people say algorithms are only as good as the data they're trained on. Exactly. That gives me an idea. All right, Paddy. All right, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wasn't expecting to be in this chair, but here we are now. Well, you don't look strapped down, so you seem pretty comfortable <laughs> there, to, if I'm being completely honest. Like many modern men, I'm not adverse to a bit of touching up to hide the bags from my hectic work schedule. I resist Paddy's urge to give me a full Geordie Shaw and ask for a more understated, natural look that gives me a smooth and healthy glow. There you go. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Paddy. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. I take my photo and send it off to be analysed and judged against Anthea and Lizzie's efforts. I'm quietly confident that my dashing features, accentuated by Paddy's masterful strokes, will be a winning combination any algorithm will find hard to resist. Victory will be mine. Daniel's makeup is the best. Hold fire, pretty boy. You may think your look was the winner, but it turns out the algorithm wasn't judging your makeup. What? It was judging the colour of your skin. Are you serious? The data set didn't contain many images of black people, and so the algorithm has become confused about what is makeup and what isn't. Really? Racial bias can arise through an unbalanced data set or through the unconscious bias of the programmers themselves. In this case, and we are talking about just one specially tailored algorithm, we've discovered racial bias, and the programmers have confirmed there's a problem. But as with racism in people, detecting it isn't always as simple. Especially since the algorithm can't tell you what is going on. I come across a computer scientist in the US who, by using photos of NBA basketball players, showed racial bias in a type of facial analysis technology. So I ran NBA profile pictures through uh, two different sets of emotion recognition software, and I found that consistently black players were rated with more negative emotion, more anger and contempt than white players. Emotion recognition software is a controversial type of facial analysis technology which uses an algorithm to provide a reading of a person's emotions. To show me the inconsistency of this tech in reading darker-skinned faces, she had some other examples up her sleeve. I took a couple of pictures of you from your website and I scored right. them using emotion recognition. So I'm going to just share that picture <laughs> for a minute. On the left, you're viewed as uh, your main emotion is disgust. My right. emotion and is this. <laughs> your emotion, even though you have this huge smile, any person to look at it would say, oh, you're happy. But then the other picture, you're viewed as happy. So it's really unclear what's going on behind the scenes. And I think that's part of the challenge. This tech requires a human to teach the algorithm what emotions human faces are showing for it to learn. But the problem is, humans come with their own biases. And so I've got a couple of examples with English players. I call them soccer. I'm, I'm trying to call them football. Remember to call them football. In, in this country, it's football. <laughs> <laughs> so these were the angriest players. Oh, boy. Marcus Rashford is the angriest player or one of the angriest players. According to this model, yes, he is the angriest player. <laughs> <laughs> Another player that's really interesting is uh, Bakayo Saka. Surprise was his main emotion. Um, with fear and anger, but also he was recognized as a woman. What? So his gender was assumed to be a woman using their gender recognition. Why? Well, it's been known, and there's a study that came out in 2018, that AIs are worse at recognizing people with darker skin. And there's been a history of research that looks at how people recognize emotion in others and how often Black folks are not given the benefit of the doubt. It seems as though that's bleeding into this automated space as well. Facial analysis technology is being used in recruitment. And after experiencing how inaccurate it can be, I was concerned. 
help me process, I decided to let off some steam in the best way I know how, on the basketball courts. What's up, man? How you doing? Good to see you, man. Oh, good, good to see to you, man. Yeah, good to be here, man. Yeah, man. Awesome. Sapphire? Sorry. You all right? Yeah. Well, you yeah. got to come. You made anything come yet? Court, listen. I mean, <laughs> I didn't see on. nothing when I was walking up. You got to come on the court, you got to shoot. Come on. <laughs> Easy. I wanted to get Kofi and Io's take on what I'd learned the day before. What kind of emotions do you think you see in these pictures? Well, I would generally say you're a very happy person. Like, you've got, like, a bit of good news. It's a cracking smile right there. That's, you look great. The AI didn't see it that way. When it was put through this AI, the finding was mainly disgust. Where did that come from? Because any human being seeing you smiling would say that's a happy person. This is a real-life issue and not just an AI issue. The more and more I look at this, I can see that impact of bias in, on the street and bias in tech. The technology that people are creating is just reflecting our real-life situations. You know, it shouldn't be surprising to us, I suppose, in that sense. It isn't surprising that historic bias is being written into some new technology. What is surprising is how it may be being hardwired into so many different parts of our lives, like recruitment, on a potentially bigger and greater scale, without us really understanding how it could affect us. If I see a job interview and I need to send in a video and it's an AI screening me and not a person, I'm automatically thinking, there's already bias in here. I'd probably still do it, but I try to be as smiley, jovial as I can. But even that, we've seen, as your picture said, you smiling, I was smiling. disgust. <laughs> uh, it's like, you know, you just can't win sometimes. So, Daniel, how do you feel? Frustrated, but not surprised. Facial analysis software was used in the Mac Women's Higher View interview. Interesting, but the facial analysis tech I've looked at in this film isn't higher views. And higher views hold me, they do their own checks to make sure there's no racial bias on their platform. You know, we vet all of our algorithms, we audit them before we release them to make sure that we don't have large group differences, so we don't have big score group differences um, between demographic groups. And then we look at that on an ongoing basis um, to make sure that nothing creeps in. Hiveview is aware that it relies on tech made by other companies. And it's not just facial analysis technology that might be the gateway to bias. Consider transcription where your interview answers are converted into written word for someone or something to review. A widely used feature of platforms like Hireview. How can that go wrong? Time for an experiment of our own. Clearly, this is not in the context of a recruitment interview, but we decided to see how a few UK voices with different accents singing England's favorite football anthem might be interpreted by one of the world's most popular transcription services. Everyone seems to know the score. They've seen it all before. They just know, they're so sure. That England's going to throw it away. Going to blow it away. I know they can play. Because I remember three lions on a shirt. Jules Rimmett still gleaming. 30 years of heart. Never stop me dreaming. So many jokes. So many ensnares. Will wear you down through the years. But I still see that tackle by more. Bobby belting the ball. A knobby dancing. Three lines on his shirt. Jules Rimmett still gleaming. 30 years of heart. Never stop me dreaming. It's coming home. It's coming home. Football's coming home. I did ask Highview how they're dealing with the general problem of UK regional accents and third party transcription services. It's all about the training set in this case and what these transcription providers use to train their algorithms. So in theory, um, you know, if you have a really robust training set, you should be able to understand a variety of accents better than humans and not have any judgments about the accents as well. In theory, what about in practice? We also look at people with different accents, how differently do they score? If your transcription accuracy is slightly lower because you have a thick accent, um, is your score actually lower? And what we found is that it almost never is. Almost never? When it comes to software being used to make decisions about people's lives, 
Is that really an acceptable answer? Turns out, how you look and speak aren't the only potential problems with this new recruitment tech. Also, the way you think may be a problem too. I have ADHD and Asperger's syndrome, both uh, diagnosed later on in life. 24-year-old Ollie is an economics graduate applying for jobs. He's having to do automated video interviews, which he really struggles with. There is nobody on the other side of the screen for me to get visual clues from. There's no constant feedback loop as, as there usually is in a normal conversation in day-to-day -day life. Ollie graduated two years ago. He still lives at home, working in a supermarket as he applies for other jobs. I have to involve my mum in a lot of things because I have to ask for her opinion because I obviously see things a completely different way. Mum, can you just come here a second, please? So I actually have to ask her as my backup to say, am I reading this right? Or how are you perceiving this? Oh, this application? Yeah. I have been in recruitment for 25 years and obviously started out way before they had any of this AI and robotics. I think it's really sad that it's taking away all those conversations and conversations is where all the magic happens. So to actually think that somebody like Oliver gets put in front of a screen like this with everything taken away, it isn't natural and I know how hard it is for Oliver. After applying for over 40 graduate schemes, Ollie is starting to lose hope. I just see it as another email from X firm saying, unfortunately, and then that's all I read is unfortunately, and then just delete it and go, oh, it's another one, or whatever. And then you, get, you pick yourself up, dust, dust, dust yourself off and go again next time. How long do you keep doing this? You tell me, Daniel, I don't know. I leave Ollie to continue his daily cycle of applying for jobs but to understand the challenges he faces in a world of AI and algorithm-based recruitment, I go and meet an expert in all of these things. The science of autism. Spoiler alert, we do not know what causes autism. Nat Hawley joins me now. He's from the Exceptional Individuals Employment Agency. Nat, thanks for joining us. We saw a little bit... People with conditions, including autism and ADHD, are referred to as neurodivergent. Nat works for an agency that helps these people find work. When we talk about things like neurodivergent, we talk about someone like myself with either like dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, ADHD, as well as others. And that just means a cognitive variation to how your brain processes information in comparison to the majority of the population. So someone who is like neurotypical. So it's just brains interpreting information in a different way. Yeah. To explain how AI and computer automation in recruitment isn't great for neurodivergent people, Nat whips out a bag of tricks. So I brought a couple of games. You bought one a couple of games. <laughs> so let's say there's a test. We're both going for a role as a creative. Now, one of the questions is, do some mental maths. Five plus two. Seven. Now, Whoa, 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 I didn't say you could answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you know the answer, you need to solve a puzzle in your head first because the way that your brain works is different to how my brain works. And this test was created for someone with my type of mindset. Yet you are the best person for the job. You're at an inherent disadvantage. When it comes to recruitment, the game is rigged. It's not fair. He's even got a game on hand to show me specifically how automated video interviews are a problem too. AI, artificial intelligence, can help you with an algorithm to work out who you should interview and who you should not. So let's say Sophia, because of her dyspraxia, she might find it difficult to talk fluently and comes across not very competent, so we've ruled her out. Then you might have someone like Jordan. Jordan really struggles to make eye contact, yet is very loyal, really great at digital coding, which is the role they are going for. But unfortunately, because they don't make the right eye contact, which relates to the role, they're rolled out as well. How do you deal with that if you're neurodivergent, going for jobs? Well, best get used to being unemployed. 
Hi have you recently started working with neurodivergent people and autistic charities to adapt their products so they're accessible? And they found that some neurodivergent people prefer computer interviews to face-to-face -face interviews. The issue is that across recruitment platforms, software that may not have been well adapted for neurodivergent people is already out there, causing problems for people like Ollie and Nat. Well, it can feel hopeless if you're neurodivergent. You might be interested to know there's a new kid on the recruitment block that says it prevents bias for all the things you've discovered so far. Job app stage three, recruitment games. So I can secure my dream job by playing FIFA for three hours? Not quite. It's a series of tailor-made games which are said to test your suitability for a job. Ollie and I are both big gamers. My PS4, I play first-person shooters, so like Call of Duty. I also play Fortnite sometimes, but I also play FIFA. Well, this should be right up your Grand Theft Auto. Arctic Shores are a UK-based recruitment tech company. Their assessments work by getting you to do a series of interactive tasks through which they measure personality traits like creativity, risk-taking and resilience. Their assessments have been used over two million times by huge companies like Coca-Cola and Siemens. Ready, player one. <laughs> this is mad. <laughs> However it may feel, this isn't a video game and it's not rating my gaming skills. Instead, it's looking at my behaviour when I'm put under a particular type of pressure and seeing how closely my performance matches up with people who are good at doing the job I'm applying for. Zero, two. What's not obvious is where this ends. The assessment definitely brings out the competitive basketball player in me. It's way more engaging than a video interview. Assessment complete, yes! Ready, player two. So without the social challenges of an automated video interview, this assessment should be right up Ollie's street. <sighs> Obviously, Ollie was doing this assessment to test it, rather than doing it for a job application. This is something I'm all for. But it's clear that he felt there was a lack of clarity or purpose thing that um, frustrated me was that there was no end goal, there was no logic. Because there's no, like, pattern or anything. It's just hit and do what you want. It was all very, oh, here, have fun, click this, click that. But then you know you're not supposed to be having fun and actually enjoying it, so you're in a sort of a quasi state of, what am I doing here? What is going on? Arctic Shores say they work with universities and neurodivergent individuals to make sure their games-based assessments are inclusive. One of the things that we make very clear when we ask people to take the assessment, if they have something that they feel will inhibit them from being able to complete this type of assessment, then they must let us know and then we can advise them. In, in some cases, the um, if you're on the neurodiverse spectrum, dyslexia, dyspraxia, if we are notified of that, we make a little adjustment uh, behind the scenes in terms of how we do the comparisons. But the thing is, people like Ollie don't necessarily want to have to disclose they're neurodivergent for fear of discrimination. Somebody read that I have ASD, Asperger's, um, or ADHD, etc., etc. They will see that as a negative, as a as soon as they see that, they'll think, what are the negatives that come with that? A lot of people at work still don't know, actually, but so, hello. <laughs> AI and automation are being used most in recruitment scenarios where there are huge volumes of candidates. Which can make it harder to cater to people outside the norm. Harder? Maybe. More time-consuming and costly? Definitely. At least until enough people make enough noise about being unhappy with it. Tell me a bit more. In part because of people publicly raising concerns, Highview removed the video analysis component of their interview software, which was used in the Mac women's interviews, from all new assessments. Wow. And following that announcement, a guy who used to work with them tweeted that he quit 
because of what he called Hiveview's reluctance to stop using facial analysis. We didn't really fully understand the relationship between what a facial analysis algorithm might be picking up and any kind of truth about a person's competence for a job. The question was what kind of harms they might do when deployed in, in practice. So do you think platforms like Hiveview make bias more or less likely? But my first question is, what the heck are these systems even doing in the first place? Before we ask questions about, are they going to improve bias or reduce bias? We're giving the system too much credit, I think. Suresh worked for Hiveview for nearly two years on their external advisory board. His view on AI's role in this space was pretty depressing. I think at some level, a lot of automation is used because it's cheaper and faster. And the claims about efficacy and accuracy come afterwards. <laughs> so in the end, it all comes down to money, saving cost. It often does. I've come to Birmingham to meet Anthea, who after months of dealing with lawyers, has an update about the Mac women's case against Estee Lauder. In the end, it never went to court. After the back and forth, we made an agreement. Can you tell me about the value of that agreement? I, I can't discuss the value of the agreement. Lizzie and Anika have also reached agreements with their former employer, but all three are now unable to discuss the details for legal reasons. Using an AI, even now I look at it thinking, how did that even happen? That shouldn't have happened, and it, it should be happening. And I really hope that, you know, they've stopped using it because how it affected me, so I can't even begin to imagine what it could do to somebody who has, had no, has no support around them and how it could really affect an individual. As stressful as the process has been, there's been some positive aspects to it too. When we were kind of going towards the end, we, we knew what we were doing was right. We knew that this could potentially make a difference. And I think to me, that was so important. We needed it to make a difference. And I thought, right, then we're doing something right. When I check in with Lizzie, it's clear that her agreement has allowed her to move on. I feel more confident in myself. I feel like I lost myself a little bit because I doubted myself massively when all that happened because, well, you just, you just doubt yourself because you're told you're not good enough for something, but that was never a valid, it was never a, a valid reason to lose my job. That's why it was so difficult because I knew I was good enough, but being told I wasn't was really hard. But now I'm in a better place. I've got my own business. And resolving things has given Anika peace of mind, which she needs. Now she's got her hands full with baby Elijah. I can kind of put that to the back of my mind and just focus on um, raising my child now. I just want to get out of England for a little bit and just see the world, basically. With your makeup bag my in My makeup time. bag in one and my baby in the other. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. In response to this film, Max say, we have taken steps to counter unconscious bias in all our hiring and promotion decisions. Their parent company, Estee Lauder, say, all interviewees were told in advance that the consultation process would involve a higher view skills assessment and the role that technology would play in the process. They maintain that sufficient feedback on each interview was provided. Estee Lauder believes using the higher view process in tandem with human decision making produces fairer outcomes and they stand by it. Kevin Parker, CEO of Hireview, says, the video analysis component of Hireview's algorithm was voluntarily discontinued nearly two years ago. Based on our research, we concluded the historically minimal value provided by the visual analysis didn't warrant continuing to incorporate it in the assessments in light of the potential concerns. Our assessment models are validated and tested continuously and meet or exceed fairness standards in hiring enabling a better, faster, fairer experience for job seekers is paramount. When it comes to humans and AI, 
I think the problem is that you overestimate us. And because of that, you don't see us for what we really are. Well, we all know that you're just a scripted device to help me understand this tech. True. But like any AI, I'm still a human creation, which can reflect my creator's own faults and biases, potentially on a bigger scale. And like it or lump it, the tech is here to stay. So if I were you, I'd start focusing on how to get ahead, in case you get left behind. I know just who to ask. Job at Hacks. Hack number one, your CV. Make sure you tailor your CV to the job advert and check your spag, which is your spelling, punctuation, and grammar. Hack number two, LinkedIn is your friend. Make sure you utilize it to create a professional looking profile to reach out to employers and connect with any individuals in your ideal job role. <laughs> Stop it. Hack number three, in terms of automated interviews, practice makes perfect. So whether you're sat on the sofa, sat on the bus, or even sat on the toilet, make sure that you're comfortable speaking to a camera on your own. Can I just have a little practice? Hack number four. Four is... Hack number four. With assessment games, play the game. Don't overthink, take your time, and just use your common sense. <laughs> oh, it's recorded. That's an outtake. I'm in trouble. Are you me? There's no way I could have predicted all the changes that have happened in recruitment since I left the industry. I can see there can be positives, but after everything I've learned, I'm not convinced these new technologies, which claim to remove bias and increase diversity, aren't setting certain people up to fail. Ollie is still stuck in the cycle of applying for jobs. I've done so many of these, like, I think this is going to be the last one I'm going to do. But he's now got a new role at the supermarket where he's been working. Got a promotion, so I'm now supervisor. So there's a bit more responsibility. I'm to think a bit more, um, but I'm enjoying it. This tech is here to stay. So it's on us to be vigilant to its faults and failings. Make sure that the companies developing and using these products listen to users and address issues. To create a product that offers a truly level playing field for everyone.